Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Kelby, Rebecca, Megs, Heather, Dave. We're all here from the Red Newt team. We're going to taste some Merlot. We're really excited about this. Um, tonight's wines are the 2012 and 2007 Merlot from Glacier Ridge Vineyards, one of our, well, our favorite Merlot site. And here's Miguel. Hello, Miguel. Glad you could join us hey, again. Hey, Miguel. Hey, Miguel. So uh, I was just telling our, our peeps out there in, in the, the virtual world, we're uh, going to be tasting two of my favorite wines today, the 2012 and 2007 Glacier Ridge Merlot. I mean, it's, it's just such a singularly special sight. I mean, you can tell when you're out there. Uh, you know, I, I think especially tasting Merlots today, people don't think of Finger Lakes and Merlot. And we touched on that uh, last Saturday, but... Uh, the Glacier Ridge Merlots in particular are just phenomenal wines. Uh, and I think, you know, I think the, the first thing I always get questioned about is uh, Merlot, that ripens there. And I think people don't realize that at Glacier Ridge, it, it's ripe a good three, sometimes four weeks ahead of the Cab Franc. I mean, it's, you know, ripeness is not the concern. If anything, it can be uh, battling how ripe it can get in such a, a sunny exposed site. And there's not a ton of Merlot planted in the Finger Lakes in, in terms of other reds, uh, comparison to other reds. And um, I think probably that it is a little bit more sensitive in terms of winter injury. So um, most Merlot vineyards are on pretty, uh, pretty cushy sites close to the lake, very well protected. So in terms of total acreage available to plant Merlot, uh, it's not as extensive as the acreage, good acreage available for say Cabernet Franc. Yeah. So let's jump right into these wines. I think we'll start with the 2012. And uh, the 2012 was a uh, one, well, actually both of these vintages, 2007 and 2012, are probably the two warmest sort of ripest vintages of the century. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys just speak a little bit about um, just the general production treatment versus say, the Red Newt label than this one, than the Glacier Ridge ones? Well, I would have to say, um, and these two vintages um, were pretty, um, pretty, pretty consistent from vintage to vintage, from 27, 2012. I don't think we, um, uh, uh, so really, um, in terms of operations and winemaking, they're a relatively close comparison. Um, and especially in 2007, we only made about 100 cases of this Merlot. So that would maybe two tons of Merlot of fruit to work with. And um, uh, much as, in the, as with the 2012, that would have gone into one ton fermenters, um, would have been um, inoculated um, in 27, probably in 2012 as well, would have been inoculated with a yeast a D254, which we really love for reds. And um, kind of, uh, we heated up a little bit to get the fermentation going. So we'd see a fairly warm fermentation early on, way up in you know, 90, 100 degrees in that for that first four to five percent of sugar um, fermentation. And then by the time it got down to maybe 15 <coughs> or so, we'd let the temperature taper back down again. So um, we get a little bit more, a little bit more heat, a little more extraction of uh, tannins and anthocyanins and anthocyanins when the alcohol was low and then as alcohol got higher we used kind of were a little bit more gentle because what you extract at low and high alcohols are kind of kind of different characteristically and we're looking for that color and the sort of the richness but not as much of the uh, aggressive tannins so that that's been certainly was approached with these two wines and then um, they would have been pressed in our basket press that which we still use today um, that holds about a ton of, of fruit, of fermenting fruit. Um, and I think both of these probably went directly to barrel out of the press. So each fermenter would have had about two and a half or three barrels, one of the very the free run, then one of lightly pressed and one of heavy pressed. And then that's, they go through ML in the barrel. And later on in the spring, that's when we start culling out um, and formulating our blends based on vineyard and based on barrel expression and, and fermentation. So that's kind of the, the over overall approach that we've, we've had for many years. Mm -hmm. I remember it with the 2012 in particular, the, uh, just the, the reams of notebook paper that I went through with the blending sessions for the different, uh, uh, between the Merlot barrels and the Cap Franc barrels and doing a Bordeaux blend, you know, it was, it's trying to make sure everything finds its, its best home in its right place. 
Yeah, it does. It sort of uh, loads some of the, I want to say burden, but also fun uh, later in the year because um, since nothing's blended, we end up with, you know, every ton of fruit, we have three barrels. So we have to go through and taste every barrel and then sort of start jockeying around and putting the puzzle pieces together to um, both make, you know, sort of to make the wines that we want to make, you know, make the labels that we want to make. And we, we hope that we'll have our sort of standard, standard cream Merlot, label Merlot that we tasted last week. Um, and we hope to have single vineyard expressions that really we feel express the site and really express the quality. And we hope to have sort of a over the um, sort of an overarching blend of Cab Franc Merlot and Cab Sauvignon um, that's really dynamite and expressive. And I say we hope because if we go through this exercise and it's not there, we just don't make it that year. <laughs> but in like a year like 2012 or 2007, it's, um, it works. I mean, 12 seems like exceptional for a lot of regions anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's exceptionally so for the Finger Lakes. So you guys had a hot, hot year that year, no? Yeah. In fact, um, I was just looking at the harvest notes for these two wines in the, the 2007, which was a really ripe vintage. Uh, we harvested in October, I think, 19th. And to 2012, which was exceptionally warm, we harvested on September 28th, which is uh, really, really early um, for this vineyard. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was that's, at 24 that's bricks. Like pick. That's like wine, wine pick times, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, mm -hmm. That's, that's, it's, I don't know. Sometimes Merlot responds really differently whenever it doesn't perform well in ripening conditions. Mm -hmm. It keeps that kind of Cab Franc DNA intact a little bit more. Um, but it, when, when it's warm, it, does something really, really fantastic. I hope you guys get that now. I mean, I've let this warm up for a little bit, this 12, but it's in that like really nice hot chocolate kind of vibe, <laughs> that smell. It kind of like sits there. It's really, really tasty. Yeah, I mean, we, and this, this 12 is uh, more or less just released, if I'm not uh, mistaken for the most part. I mean, it's, I, we've tasted it a few times over the years and just thought it wasn't, uh, I mean, we always liked where the wine was, but we thought that it hadn't really stitched together correctly yet. Uh, and there was no question it was going to, it was just a question of when. Uh, so uh, it's really nice to, to know that this wine is uh, I mean, available in quantity, really. There's a couple hundred cases of the 12. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. yeah, it is really starting to come together. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit, a um, little bit angular, you know, there's um, the oaks a little bit obtuse and the tannins are a little bit, a little bit sharp, um, but boy, it's just uh, really stitched together nicely and uh, it's got a lot of life too. It's a really lot of life, yeah. It's going. Yeah, even compared to the cream labels from last week, uh, which were showing really nicely, this 12 to me is still, I mean, all primary at this point, you know, it's, I mean, there's some, there's some sort of uh, you know, like that uh, chocolatey and, and some herbal development. But for the most part, I mean, it, it tastes super young, super fresh. Uh, there's no rush. Yeah, fr fresh is the right word for it. It's a baby of a wine. Um, and it still has that, I mean, I think you guys can feel it now after a couple sips, that like high tone side mouth act in there, like really makes you salivate pretty quickly. Um, I think that's combinations of like still acid that's still trying to figure itself out and definitely like tannin that's still really, really brusque in the, in, in the nice way. And like, and, and I mean that in like in a really kind of like cocoa powdery kind of um, texture in, in the palate. It's really exciting. I think one of the things that always gets me with the Glacier Ridge property in and of itself is that my favorite reds pretty much on a, without even thinking about specific vintage, come from these blocks. And especially Merlot. I think this is probably one of my favorite sites in all of New York State for reds, whether it's Cab Franc, whether it's a little bit of Cab Solve, the Merlot that we do on a regular basis or the Pinot Noir. I think hands down, this is always very expressive and something that's easy to hold on to and yet with a little bit of breathe time, it's great for everyday consumption. Mm -hmm. It is a quirky site in that regard. I mean, I, I 
when we've had visitors from especially wine industry visitors or wine uh, winemakers from other regions come uh, and they we talk about Glacier Ridge uh, and they just start to laugh at the sort of you know to have Pinot and Cab and Merlot uh, and you know there's actually Riesling there that we work with and there's a tiny little bit of Syrah that we get I mean and it's a postage stamp of a vineyard it just doesn't make any it kind of breaks some of the terroir uh, yeah, you don't, really, you don't really find that sapage in, in one spot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the fact that it ripens them all beautifully and gives these really specific characters. I mean, there's a there's an overarching vineyard characteristic to Glacier Ridge that we I, shorthand in-house is kind of like smokiness and black pepper, uh, especially for younger wines. But, uh, and I think sometimes that can get, uh, people can confuse that with oak, especially with a younger expression. Uh, but it's still there once the oak is integrated. And frankly, it's there. We see it uh, in-house with the Pinot Gris and the Riesling, right? Like that's, there's no reason that those two grapes should, you know, uh, be expressing that otherwise. It's really something new. Is Glacier Ridge um, kind of uh, as full of shale as the rest of the Finger Lake sites that you guys have? It's, it's more uh, shale driven than, than the others. Uh, it's, uh, is there... Oh, go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, I was just questioning whether or not there was Dunkirk on that on that no. vineyard. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Dunkirk is what the knoll is on, which is a kind of a sandstone derived, pretty uh, relatively rare soil type in the Finger Lakes. Uh, the Glacier Ridge site is uh, it, uh, it's Arnott, I think is Arkport. Arkport. And this like quirky soil type that you really don't see anywhere. Uh, in the Finger Lakes, generally speaking, not not for uh, vineyard planting, because it's uh, you know the average depth to bedrock is six inches, so there's basically no topsoil to speak of, and then you're right into the shale. I think uh, that's why it's, it does that really smoky transparency pretty quickly. Yeah, there's there's a very similar kind of taste that you would get, say, with like um, really poor drain, like or I guess like really poor water retention soils, uh, very similar to say like some stuff in Germany or, or um, some parts of Spain where you get that really almost like inky, smoky, crunchy kind of back palate flavor. Um, it's, it's exceptional. Well, how about this 2007? For me, the seven is exactly where I like to drink a Merlot. Mm, I, I love where this wine is at right now. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the oak really uh, integrated this wine probably five years ago, to my memory, in tasting it. Uh, it was really when it started to sing. Uh, and it's probably been, you know, I feel like Megs and I track these things a little bit, but I'd say it's probably been a year since I really tried this wine. Uh, and it's uh, kind of the, the earthy notes have really started to come out in it in a positive way. Yeah. But then that also you get that really beautiful background of that, like mentholated kind of eucalyptus mm -hmm. note. Really, really lovely. Um, mm -hmm. th there's these Bordeaux varieties, Cab Franc and Merlot especially, like whenever they get that mentholated note. I mean, Cab Sauv, that's kind of a given. Um, but with Merlot, like, like when, when, when you get the right kind of age with the right kind of treatment and the right kind of interaction with oxygen, man, it is smooth. And, and not just that, but like it's it's, it's so delicious when you get the right kind of combination because it's that you get that texture that's just really, really soft and really, really smooth. And then you get this really delicious fruit that's also kind of just wants to lay it in your palate, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's really lovely. This, this reminds me a lot of some satellite vintages on the right bank. Um, there's a very like cool stony sensibility to a lot of the, terroirs that remind me a lot of, of right bank Bordeaux. Um, but you're right in that, that smoky kind of aftertaste, that aftertaste like really just continues all the way through. It's just like you smoked a really good menthol. <laughs> and we were looking earlier uh, at inventory uh, and we have a decent amount of the, uh, you know, we have a good amount of the seven. We obviously have a lot of the 12 because it's just released, but the 10 also, and the 10 is kind of the, mm. 
you know, I mean, there were four really notable warm, even vintages uh, within that, like a, a what an eight year span there, five, seven, 10, 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that 10 is uh, also just drinking <clears throat> fantastically. The eight was probably Meg's in my favorite, which might be why it's, uh, there's not any of it left, but <laughs> I don't think they drank that much of it. But like, anytime we were talking to someone about what they should try, we'd be like, try the eight, try the eight. But, there might not be much of the seven left uh, in the next coming in the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be very cool. Well, I only disappear. <laughs> and Dave, when was your first Merlot from Glacial Ridge? What What was your first vintage? Do you know? I'm thinking we in 2004. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Was it just reserve Merlot that year, or was that vineyard? I mean, it was a, it was a single vineyard, but was it labeled as such? single vineyard? And I believe that that's the first. That's when we launched our first single vineyard label. At that time, we were doing like a reserve Riesling and our white label, um, and it was all from Sawmill Creek, but we hadn't uh, actually labeled it with the vineyard name. So I think this Glacier Ridge Merlot of that vintage was the first actual single vineyard labeled wine that we made. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting to note too when it comes to Glacier Ridge, um, <clears throat> there have been additional plantings that have happened over the years. So the uh, amount of wine that we'll be able to continue to produce with the Glacier Ridge label is going to increase, which is exciting for us, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Most notably, I would say on the Pinot Noir front, uh, which was, that was always the the most uh, limited supply. So uh, Tony's new plantings there have been a, a real boom to us. So I don't know that he felt that way in 2018 when uh, the vintage from uh, hell <laughs> really, uh, really wrecked havoc on uh, Pinot Noir. But you know, it, and last year was great. So. <laughs> well, was 2018 was the wettest year on record in how many years? 30, I think. I, I think it was more than that because Cornell, yeah. when they put out that initial report, said that it went as far back as the 60s and they thought it went back even further than that because wow. between August 18th and the first snowfall in November we had 69 inches of rain and yeah, that did not include the the spring rains that we had had as well so that was a wet year yeah I felt like I could have canoed to work yeah <laughs> We could have paddled a few times. <laughs> and it was it was almost a requirement to go look to because of where Glacier Ridge is kind of down. Uh, I mean, it's a it's kind of a semi-private road uh, with a gully on one side and a kind of drainage ditch on the other. Like there was no way I was taking my own car down to to look at Glacier that year <laughs> or by that fall. I should say it's always the, the work. Truck. <laughs> it definitely was. Um. So just. In comparison to how we're talking about 2018, which was obviously like a really challenging year across the board, um, Dave, would you say that 2007 and 2012 kind of rolled into what would be termed like lazy winemaker vintages where you could actually just sit back a little and watch the fruit ripen and not stress about pick dates? Or do you think there was more going on those years? Well, You know, um, they were both, they were similar in that fashion. We, I think Kelby would talk, talk to another tasting about being able to just sort of pick whenever you wanted in 2012. I mean, because we didn't have the pressure of impending doom, you know, and rain and weather systems so much. Everything looked great and it was right. But, you know, in a way, that could be pretty stressful. Because, you know, if you're battling a challenging harvest, you know that you're going to you're going to make it work and it's going to be it's going to be great. And everybody's going to say, man, you really pulled that off. But when you have a harvest like 2012 or 2007 for Merlot, if you screw it up, it's like, what did you do? <laughs> Why are you in this job? <laughs> No, they were both really, really do- just delightful vintages to to uh, to work. Mm-hmm. I would say what, what speaks incredibly well to the vineyard and also to uh, especially Dave's winemaking with both of these is, uh, and I'm thinking of seven in particular, which was a little, a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit more droughty than twelve. Uh, there were a lot of beautiful wines the next year, reds the next year that uh, ended up being blown out with a little bit of age uh, because. I mean, and they were, be- they were beautiful at the time, but the, the ripeness maybe had been pushed a little far uh, uh, for, for what 
what would work for aging, you know, and there's different, different aims for every wine. There's some wines you want to drink in a couple of years. Uh, yeah. But for this to be a, an 07 Merlot that's, uh, you know, holding just so beautifully and so freshly, that's, that's not all that common for the Finger Lakes from that vintage. Yeah, we had not seen a vintage like this in the Finger Lakes, I think, ever um, since we've been growing Lunifera Reds. <clears throat> and uh, we had some really nice vintage, a string of really nice vintages in the late 90s. And, um, but they were more like, oh, you know, even 05 was a little riper, but they were nice vintage, nice ripe fruit. Um, so the mindset of a cool climate red winemaker off can sort of go in the direction of, well, okay, I want to make sure I get enough extraction. I want to, you know, sort of you know, give me more, give me more, and, you know, where do I put the pieces together? So when a, a vintage like 07 or especially 2012 come along, you have to say, you have to kind of switch gears and say, okay, <laughs> um, I can I can actually easily extract too much, and I can have, I can be, you know, sort of loaded on more than I should, where in a more typical vintage in the past, it was always kind of, um, always sort of a little bit more of pushing the envelope and trying to get more in an elegant way and not having to worry so much about overdoing it. But in these hotter vintages, it's been, 07 was really the first one that I experienced you know, since the you know, late 80s, where I had to make that kind of switch of mindset. And it was, it was kind, of, kind of tricky. And uh, if you didn't make that, we ended up with wines like Kelby's alluding to, that just were just too big and over the top for, um, for, for the fruit to handle. So a former Red Newton employee, Kevin Durland, popped up. And one of his questions, uh, he says, in my humble opinion, I feel like the tannins are a little bit more prominent in 12 than they are in 7. Mm -hmm. uh, and for, the, for those who are maybe new to tasting aged and vintage dreads, uh, would either Megs or Kelby like to explain to us why that is? Megs doesn't. Okay. Uh <laughs> Megs is just going, nope. Kelby's uh, on that. <laughs> the the shorthand for it is that with aging, uh, the tannins and reds uh, have uh, the ability to uh, create longer chains to, to polymerize. Uh, and the larger the chains, uh, the less discrete tannin molecules and the, the more integrated the tannins should feel. Uh, right? There's a million other factors going on there. Uh, but uh, that's generally speaking and when we talk about a, a red wine almost being too young it can be because the tannins are too jumpy uh i know miguel if you want to jump in because you probably i mean you're you're the expert here in seeing a real spread of red wine ages yeah for sure i mean uh in like very simple layman's terms right um the reason why uh, older red wines seem to feel seem to look a little bit lighter in color is that all of those like tannin chains, just like you were saying, Kelby, like have fallen out. And that's why for a lot of older reds, you'll also see kind of like chunks on the bottom of your bottles. Um, and that's, that's exactly that. It's fallout of, of some of those kind of really heavy molecules, literally heavier molecules going to the bottom or the sides of your bottles. Um, and that in turn, when you think about like what, what that does to what's in the bottle, right? It tends to have things that, that are gonna settle softer. Your alcohol is never gonna go away. So it's actually just gonna make it feel like a little bit lighter. And then some of those characteristics that we keep talking about as, as wine professionals, whether or not they're like primary or secondary or tertiary, like we're looking at either fruit, we're looking at kind of how it's made and then we're looking at age kind of all together. Um, and then when, when tannins become softer, um, and it's, it's a factor of a couple of things, but uh, for us, what we look at in terms of, I think like in the restaurant or even in retail settings would be kind of how much time it's spent, um, where it's supposed to live, whether or not it's in a bottle or a barrel or a fermenter or a tank. Um, and the second is how old it's, it's been, because those are, those are directly related to each other. So if, if when we're talking about something that's a really softer tannin or with age kind of the, the general thing, right? The tannin just tends to get softer. It's the, the edges just tend to get polished a little bit more. And with all of that, kind of those other compounds that are in the wine can show off a little bit better. And that's why we're experiencing some of these kind of earthier notes. When we talk about these kind of mentholated notes also for only because of aged wines. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a byproduct of, of wines kind of just chilling, and like letting them hang out. Um, so that's, I think that's why, I mean, these might just be 
five years apart, but you can see kind of what that big difference can look like um, treated exactly the same way, you know, when seller conditions aside and, and everything else that, that, that are kind of uh, excel or out of control. Um, there are plenty of other uh, factors that affect uh, that. But if, if, especially if you guys are kind of treating them the same way in the winery proper, then all of that just has to do with the wine kind of just really settling in in terms of its personality. Um, with, and you can see the run through between these two wines, I think. Um, with 12, it, it's still kind of that, like, it, kind of like you said, there's still like excitable tannins there. It's really, they're grippy in the right way. Um, and they, they tend to have that really kind of that, that dusty kind of quality, as opposed to say like the seven where it's, it's really even. It's like you're spreading cake frosting. There's a really, really interesting kind of uh, texture difference between the two. I mean, and you can kind of see it in aroma also, is that in the 12, you'll get more of these kind of earthy, kind of like bunched up kind of characteristics, as opposed to the seven where it's a little bit more kind of even, kind of all throughout, you'll get, and you'll get more of that kind of, like I said, that mentholated, that kind of almost minty kind of characteristic there. Um, we lean more on tobacco, say for example, um, you know, you get kind of really dry tobacco in the 12, and then you get this really delicious, like wet leaf in the seven. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, what you're really touching on too a little bit, Miguel, is um, kind of speaking to ageability of wines, where if it's like first first vintage that it's, you know, out like a year after it's been, you know, in bottle and it's just super drinkable, like, yes, please drink that now. It's, it's designed mm -hmm. to be that way. But if you've got something that's a little bit grippier, a little bit more challenging at that point, this wine is very clearly designed to like, Hang on, wait, and see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, it's. I don't think it's just ageability. I think it's also age worthiness. I think these these wines are definitely age worthy, and we're talking about two very different things, right? Yes, we're talking about that like growth curve of drink this now and then in two years maybe don't touch it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I think that twelve is like right at that like okay like you can see this in ten years still. But right now it's like, it's almost at the edge of that, like, all right, maybe don't touch this for a while. <laughs> the seven's definitely like, I'm here, baby. Like, let's go. Um, and and that's, that's a really nice difference to see, especially from fruit from the same site. Um, you get a really expressive, very like personality driven wine like this. Um, and then, yeah, we're talking about, I'm, I think most of the, the, the worth of that age, we talked about pH earlier. Um, and obviously now we're talking a little bit about like, t like tan and softness or tan quality. Um, I think the last thing to consider would definitely be like, um, that extraction thing that you guys were talking about earlier, David, you know, maybe, maybe we don't express the site too much in terms of like what we're getting out of fruit quality, because we want this to kind of evolve really, really slowly. Um, when, when you look at the things that are common with each other here, the fruit, I think, is one thing that's really consistent with Glacier Ridge. There's this really, like, sexy, plummy, um, I don't know, it just feels like it just sticks everywhere mm -hmm. kind of quality. Um, and I think the filigree that kind of comes along with it is the age, the vintage, uh, a little bit of just like that, leaving it alone time in your cellar. So it's, it's nice to be able to come back to wines like this. Um, and really obviously like see the differences in terms of where they are in terms of their growth. Um, but also just the, the exciting kind of point of like where, where this wine actually is in its life, like where it is now. It's something to remember that like the reason why we drink and taste red wine the way that we do now is a direct result of Merlot a generation ago. Hmm. And, and the reason why I have such reference for red wines as I do. When people tell you about a red wine taste, they're talking about Merlot, not anything else, because Merlot is the one that really you, your parents gravitated to in the 90s. You know, when, when this whole French paradox thing was happening, even like right at the turn of the millennium, um, Merlot was the number one grape globally, globally, not just in acreage, but also in production and consumption. Like there's a reason why Merlot is popular. There's a reason it's easy to say, it's easy to drink, it's easy to eat with. Um, it's, it's kind of, it, it, gave, it gave wine, and I think wine the, in the industry that we know it now as, as restaurant professionals, these moments, right? The reason why, like, when, you, when you can say Sancerre, when you can say Cabernet Sauvignon, 
without batting an eye. Merlot gave us that. And Merlot was the gateway wine for a lot of us to be able to say, okay, this is what red wine's supposed to taste like. Now let's look at what the other stuff is. And for us to have a, a really informed baseline wine, that's great. Um, and yeah, you're right in that there was a little bit of a downturn because Pinot Noir sounded so much more sexy or so much more cool. <laughs> um, part of it was also like Pinot Noir is a fickle grape to grow. I'm sure you guys know this and it's expensive. It is expensive. The reason why Merlot continues to be popular, and I think that's why I'm such an advocate for it now, is that this price for Merlot stays the same for good Merlot, good Merlot. Now, there's always going to be, there, yes, there's always going to be like box Merlot. There's always going to be stuff that's going to be under quality. But, you know, so, so is Sauvignon Blanc. So is Cabernet Sauvignon. So there's going to be things that we're going to have to sacrifice for, for some of that. But in terms of just general production and, and kind of, pure pleasure i think merlot's got a lot of things beat the, the fact that we don't have to worry about i mean we're we're privileged in the fact that we have some really beautiful vintages here that we're tasting today but give me something out of like 19 20 and you're probably going to be okay with merlot i think that that's the that's one of the most joyful parts about the grape is that it is so forgiving and it's so open and so delicious like from the get-go we don't have to wait for it and I think that's something that people have to remember. Yeah. Now that the 07s had a couple of minutes to open up, I was, I was lazy. I didn't get back into this until about 15 minutes before we started. So my 07 is now just really starting to open up and yeah. absolutely loving it now that it's had a little bit of breathe time. <laughs> yeah. Put her in a pasta canner and it like really, really helps. <laughs> yeah. I've been pondering these wines and since I, I, I saw Kevin Durland who made a comment, he's listening. So Kevin was uh, uh, my harvest uh, assistant in 2005, which was another really great uh, Merlot vintage. And um, I think he, 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 uh, he, he did most of the punch downs in 2005. And I think he, would, he was looking pretty, pretty butch by the end of the <laughs> But anyway, um, you know, three or four years ago, when we taste um, the 05 and 07 side by side, they tasted a lot like the 07 and the and the 12 do now. And uh, part of it was age, but part of it was sort of a uh, sort of a progression of, of vintage because 05 was a really ripe vintage, but not quite as over the top and hot as 07. So 07 was a really nice vintage, but not quite as hot and over the top as 12. And then you have the, the additional overlay of the aging curves of these three wines. And it's really, uh, it's really, uh, it, it lets you sit here and just drink a glass and drink another and just think and reflect. And <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. I mean, just looking into the future, considering these uh, other vintages past 2012, mm -hmm. um, what do you guys think about, you know, the Merlots coming out of Glacier Ridge for the next couple of years? They look really good. I mean, 16 was really, 16 was a drought year. Uh, so that uh, put in a positive sense for uh, for the Reds. Um, and then, uh, you know, Mer Merlot at Glacier Ridge is kind of like Riesling in the Finger Lakes. Like there weren't really bad vintages. There are obviously all-star vintages, but it's pretty rare to have uh, something that, that bottoms out. Uh, and even... Uh, I'm thinking about it, even 18, right? We've talked about 18 being a terrible year. The 18 Merlot is actually beautiful. Like uh, that, yeah, that It's hard to mess it up, right? It's hard to yeah. mess good Merlot. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we did a, a single vineyard Glacier Ridge Merlot in 2006. Did, did we not? Yeah. I don't think so, Dave. We didn't. Ooh. I, I think I used to have that we, on the list. It? Just a couple oh, some of the stuff. cooler vintages oh, that, that, that really cut yeah. back in a single vineyard red production, the Merlot and the Glacier Ridge site has really come through for us. I think Dave really keyed it on something properly um, because we have continued to use the same kind of uh, style of oak program that Dave was using back in the day. Like there was just a beautiful synergy that happens with Merlot and the oak barrels that it goes into and it really does express itself nicely. Um, and, you know, moving forward, we kind of switched from inoculating um, to having spontaneous fermentations, but we're still seeing very similar characteristics coming from um, the Merlots that we had then. So I, I think you're going to see a little bit of progression as far as maybe a little bit of like tweaking wine style, a little bit more cold soaking, but I think the Merlots from Red Newt are going to stay true with um, how they express themselves. Um, maybe wanting a little bit more time in bottle um, and, and kind of, uh, you know, moving forward, 
kind of integrating the upper plantings that we've started having coming online as well. So we'll have a little bit of a, a style difference with that, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I want to add to that, you mentioned bottle, bottle aging. The, the reds, you know, my approach to, to the reds and the Figure Lakes, you know, starting back, you know, in the early 90s, is uh, always been to kind of not do, generally all the reds are bottled before the next vintage. We don't do a lot of extensive oak aging because um, just looking at the fruit, looking at how the wines progress, um, I've always felt that in this region and in the vineyards we work with, you're much better off getting in the bottle and spending the extra time in the bottle to age than the extra time in the cellar. I mean, just it just feels right. And I think it's, it's uh, often borne out that that's been the right decision. Yeah, we, we don't find these, neither one of these would have seen much finding. And you know, if they, if they were fined, it might've been a light egg white finding or, or maybe none at all. Um, not, I mean, there's, we're usually not, you know, the best way to have a perfectly composed and balanced tannin structure in a wine is to make it that way not to make it another way and then take things out. I mean, that's just sort of a, I don't know, <laughs> sort of a general, general philosophy. So um, um, besides some, some fairly gentle or minimal finding, the answer would be generally be no, and then it's kind of a case by case thing. And in filtration, I believe both of these, these would have gone through a filter, but I don't believe we mem sterile filtered either of these. They would have gone through a cellulose pad to filter out the chunks and, you know, um, and not really have an aggressive filtration. Um, we set up some trials. Um, actually, there's still some trials in the cellar. We need to taste there's, them. There's still somewhere. <laughs> like the late 90s. <laughs> to really see how, how filtration impacts wines that were aged. We forgot them, about them for a decade or, or more. So mm. we need to taste those. But um, yeah, I, I pretty early on, I shut, start, started shying away from wines that were inherently stable, you know, based on chemistry and, and microbiology. Um, sort of shied away from real tight filtration. Um, part of it, or, or a lot of filtration, and it's not so much that um, the stuff that gets, oh, what I want to say, with a small lot like this, it's only 100 cases, and you have, a, you know, a big chunk, think of it, you know, you have these filter pads or filter media, whatever they are, and uh, they add up, they make, you know, a, 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 a rack full of filter sheets. They're pretty skinny, you know, and the wine goes through them, but they add up. If you clump them all together, they're probably about the volume of a loaf of bread. And at the end of the filtration, they're really dark red <laughs> because it absorbs the color. And the stuff that comes out of the filter in the beginning is pretty pale. And then once the, the, the pads get loaded up, then it do, they don't really suck out the color component so much it, it mainly just filters out the big stuff you know or the stuff that's bigger than you get through um but on a small lot there's a real significant um stripping of the wine just because of what we call loading the pads with that stuff in the beginning um so you know and if you're at a bigger production scale and i'm not huge production scale but a bigger production scale of hundreds of gallons of going through a set of pads and the, the effect is probably pretty pretty darn minimal and the trade-offs are great but with a small lot like this, it's really hard to bring oneself to to put it through a lot of filtration and and taste the stuff that comes out of the beginning and look at all that beautiful burgundy, dark, rich, purple color in the pads when you say, oh, that could have been in my glass. <laughs> now, there is one more question, and that's for Miguel. Miguel, the, the question is, uh, how long would you recommend the canting these two specific vintages? These two specific vintages. I've had the 07 in this guy for a couple hours. Uh, I, I opened this up at two o'clock today. Mm. Um, and it's in a perfect place. Um, for the 2012, I actually didn't bother. It's, I'm drinking that out of the bottle. Um, I think the 12 actually needs a little bit more air, uh, but not too much more. Um, and really, the decanting for me only serves like three real purposes. The first one is if you want to air something out like this to get it like as expressive as you want it to be. Again, we're talking about Merlot. We don't really have to do that so much. Um, it's it's as out of the cork. It's going to be pretty much the same personality for a while. Um, and then maybe a couple hours sure. later, then it'll start to really evolve. Um, for the 12, I would have maybe decanted it maybe about another half an hour. But that's really all I, I would I would consider 
doing for either of these. The second purpose for decanting, obviously for sediment, and like I don't think these are throwing anything. Mm -hmm. And then the third, which is purely, purely for yourself, it's just aesthetic. If you like the decanter that you're using and it's pretty, just use it. Um, but there's no other purpose for, for, for decanting. I don't think that this really requires it so much either of these wines, the seven in, in particular, I think that that was just really like a vanity move for me. Um, I like, I, it's just, I think it's just general rule of thumb. I, if it's, if it's a little bit older, I'll decant it anyway, just in case there is a little bit of fallout, but you know, predictably for Merlot, you don't really need it. Um, for these two, maybe a half an hour max, but that's about it. I don't, I, I don't think that we'll need to worry about getting these into okay. too much air. The most important thing is that you have a glass that you enjoy it in and then you drink it. <laughs> I think the, the truth that, or the irony perhaps at Red Newt is that more often than not, uh, our Rieslings are what, will, especially younger ones, will actually benefit from the air of decanting, right? That first use of a decanter to kind of open them up and let them evolve a little bit. If you're opening something relatively, or Riesling from us relatively young, which is five years or less. Like, as crazy as it might seem to put a white wine in the decanter, right, that, that's counterintuitive, but it actually... Uh, sometimes, sometimes they absolutely need it. The younger, the younger the Rieslings are, and the tighter those things are, absolutely. I think higher pH, like, almost necess necessitates it. Um, and then for aged Rieslings on the other side of the spectrum, especially if it's got a lot of time on it, um, those definitely could use a decanting because you get, you get to really unlock the the petrol chains on it. You know, the, those kind of gasoline smells can really, some, for, for some older vintages of Riesling, they get to really, really blow off um, slash integrate better into your glass after a little bit of decanting. Um, that's, but just a question for you guys in the cellar in terms of, so if we're not really finding or filtering, are you guys doing any sort of like other processes, say like racking maybe for clarity or like racking for a little a bit of oxygenation or? Not as much for oxygen. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, it goes into the barrel sometime in November or December. Uh, yeah. if, <laughs> if we've planned things correctly, we don't have to move the barrels much at all, uh, which is good for multiple reasons because we don't want to move them, um, let alone the, uh, the, the disturbing of the lees there. Uh, and then uh, when, we, when we rack out, uh, usually the following summer, things are usually, the lees are really compact at that point. I mean, you know, we'll have to rack out and we'll take a little bit of the lees with it. Uh, but uh, you, are, you are racking, you're not racking straight to bottle, are you? No, no. Yeah, but there's not a lot. I mean, if you look at sort of the Bordeaux model of, you know, two or three or, you know, sort of routine racking throughout yeah. the course of the selling, that's not what we do. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was mostly the question. Was that? It's just there until spring. It's uh, generally, I mean, for these two wines, especially 07, I don't remember what we did with the 012. The 07, I'm sure, would have been racked once um, and then assembled into blending lots, blends assembled, gone back to barrel for a few months, racked out, bottled. You know, sort of pretty, pretty hands off, pretty low impact kind of cellar handling. But then the rest of it is really just bottle conditioning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, total, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to see against, say, some of the Bordeaux that, and some of the wines that we see here a lot, especially considering Merlot. Um, it, it's a different kind of evolution, you mm -hmm. know, get, when you get these very, very singular expressions of Merlot, uh, and especially with the oak treatment that you guys have. Um, I think it's a really, really exciting way to, to look at Merlot in this lens. The, to your, when we talk about, you know, this, this terroir idea, I think it's a, it's a very, I think it's more the hand of like what you guys do in your winery than it is like really like the site, but the fruit is really kind of the, the defining factor for me in terms of like where it's coming from. And that you get that, that yeah, it's like that smoke, that cigarette smoke, that's just really, really enticing. Yeah, that's Glacia Rich. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. All right, now I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, well, we should probably wrap this up. I think we've been yakking here for quite a while. I don't know if anybody's still listening. But <laughs> there really are still fun. people here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, dinner. Oh, anybody, anybody, I'm getting hungry. Anybody uh, inspired? 
Well, I decided to do a little bit of Greek improv today. So we have the 07 Merlot. I'm going to pair that with a Parmesan and panko crusted asparagus and top that with a little bit of baked bits. And then I have a pork shoulder that I'm going to do a Greek marinade on. And can't really do the grill. There's a little too much snow. So the grill's a little wet. So we'll just pan fry that up today. Uh, to me, wine like this always, I mean, with the, especially with that cigarette sensibility, um, let's talk about like, a little bit about like the very refined pub food. Um, so devils on horseback, I think would be like really, really tasty with this, you know, a little bit of uh, prune and bacon, maybe stuff it with a little bit of cheese. I think that would be really lovely. Um, the best grilled cheese sandwich that you can make. Fantastic with something like this. Um, and then kind of my sleeper hit with Merlot, I think I told you guys last week, it's uh, like fish cooked in butter sauce. Um, and with wine like this, it just gives that texture. We're, we're giving that like really soft texture, really interesting, uh, different sensibility, which I think is just going to just send it over the top. Where you at, Megs? Uh, oh, well, so I have a beautiful blue cheese that is begging to be paired with a little bit of cherry chutney that I've got, uh, and I'm going to kind of munch on that while I get ready for dinner. Um, but uh, Ryan made a sourdough pizza starter today, so we've got some ham left over from Easter and stuff, and I think that we're going to try and put something together and kind of see how all of that meshes. How's it going to me? What are you up to, Kelby? Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I guess I'm going to run off the, the cigarette smoke theme and uh, <laughs> go, uh, I have some oxtails that we're going to do the, the classic Roman Cota alla Vacanara. So uh, braised oxtails with celery and uh, tomato sauce. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the uh, Romans or the Italians would be very pleased to, to, to pair it with something that smells like cigarette smoke. So. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Rebecca? Where are you at for dinner? Uh, I, I'm going to have, I'm doing a Charles Fan's clay pot chicken tonight with some brown rice. Margarita. That's just the dry version of a margarita. We don't have triple sex. Yeah, well, I, I think I'm on the chicken theme. What about too. you? Yeah, I hear some, Susan's downstairs, I hear some things clanging into the kitchen, so she may have started maybe a baked chicken if she hasn't. I think it might, even though it's a little wet outside, the sun is shining. And it might be time to fire up the grill, some grilled chicken and maybe slice up some vegetables and get them nice and charred on the grill as well. Oh yeah, for those of you who don't know, we've had snow on the ground the last couple of mornings here in upstate New York. Yes. Oh, it's pretty beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Driving over the hill today, a couple, maybe just an inch or two, but it was kind of heavy and heavy and fluffy at the same time. So all the trees, the little twigs of the trees were you know, an inch around with snow covering them. It was really spectacular. Yeah, uh, it, it's just miserable here in the city, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we would be remiss if we left without uh, giving uh, Miguel a chance. Uh, I sent the link. Heather's going to put it out uh, for the GoFundMe that, uh, oh, yes. for, for Pink you. Chinese, which yeah, is, yeah. I, was, I was super pleased to donate to yesterday. Uh, it's already exceeded its first goal. Uh, that's right. Anyone watching this, Heather will post it. Uh, and if you want to talk about what, what that's going to be. So in, uh, as you guys can see, it's obviously an empty restaurant behind us, but we've pivoted to kind of feeding the people who are taking care of us the most. So we, we want to take care of the people who are taking care of us and our neighbors. Um, so we're trying to raise as much money as we can to help feed frontline ICU emergency and paramedic workers here in the city. Um, we had initially asked for a goal of $10,000 that lets us feed about 1,500 people. And now we're trying to double that. Um, so, you know, any, any little bit helps, um, a, a meal is about, uh, $15 here, um, for the hospitals to be able to kind of make sure that it stays safe and, uh, uh, healthy and delicious for them. Um, so we're working with, it's not just us, we're working with a bunch of different partner restaurants, but for us to be able to kind of make sure that the ingredients are, are there, that the packaging is, is secure and that the transportation's safe for the hospitals. Um, we wanted to raise that. Um, so thank you for giving us a little bit of a platform to, to make sure that we're doing our part the way that we know how to combat this thing. So, you know, 
as, as much as we can, we're trying to be as, as continue to be uh, hospitality minded, service minded, and still good neighbors for the rest of us here. Um, so in a couple hours at seven o'clock when, when the streets start getting noisy, um, to applaud our service workers, we're here for them in that way. That's great. Thank you, Miguel. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, good night, everyone. And, uh, cheers. Cheers. Cheers.